Hi, this is Simon Candlish and welcome to another marvellous video. Batman, the animated series, is no stranger to disturbing storylines that can give you the creeps. Even though much of the plot points are made to appear brighter and paced faster for a younger audience, they still manage to be quite grotesque at the core. Batman's gallery of rogues is notorious for having a horde of creepy villains with creepier backstories. In a world where everyone, including the hero himself, seeks vengeance, Batman, the animated series, becomes a show with a fair share of episodes that delve into darker themes. In today's video, we will go over 12 such episodes that can be creepy not just for kids, but for adults as well. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, then hey, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, and let's begin. Number 1. Joker's Favor The first one on our list, Joker's Favor, revolves around a common man named Charlie Collins, who finds himself in a compromised position when he crosses paths with the Joker. Collins unknowingly curses at the Joker at the highway when the Joker's car cuts him off. The clown prince of crime does not take this lightly and heads off to corner Collins, who pleads the Joker for mercy by offering to do anything since he is desperate to save himself, and by extension, his wife and son. The Joker does not let go of this opportunity and takes away the man's license, promising him that he will contact Collins whenever he needs a certain favor. Two years pass by and Collins has gone off the grid after changing his name. However, the Joker had always kept tabs on him, much to Collins' displeasure. On a day when Commissioner Gordon was supposed to receive an award, the Joker calls for Collins to get his favor. With a threat looming over his family, Collins has no choice but to comply. He is soon asked to hold the door open for Harley Quinn while she heads to Gordon's dinner party at the Peregrinators Club with the cake. To save himself from the worst, Colin sends out a bat signal and heads off to perform the favor. But when he opens the door for Harley, he realizes that his hand has been glued to the handle. Harley wears a gas mask and gives another one to Collins, while a paralyzing gas is spread all across the room to immobilize everyone present. The Joker then walks into the room to congratulate Gordon by the way he knows best, by pinning a bomb to his lapel. Previously, the Joker had promised to send Collins home, but soon Collins learned that the Joker never intended to send him home alive. Batman reaches the site of action on time and launches the bomb stuck to Gordon outside, blowing up the Joker's getaway van. He frees Collins and heads off to pursue the Joker, who has escaped. Collins catches up to the Joker and knocks him down into a nearby garbage dump with a surprising punch. He is soon met with threats that target his family, but Collins does not back down. He grabs one of the Joker's bombs and threatens to kill himself and the Joker with a suicide explosion. The reason why this situation is way worse for the Joker than it might sound is because he has a dream to kill Batman in a huge spectacle or to die while trying to do so. However, him being killed by an ordinary man and without an audience would result in the notorious Joker being remembered as the criminal who was the victim of a nobody. The idea of this sends the Joker into a panic who calls for Batman Ultimately, it all ends up as a spoof when Joker surrenders, but Collins throws the bomb at him anyway, only for the bomb to turn out to be confetti. Victor Freeze. No! Number 2. Heart of Ice This episode revolves around a particularly dangerous man seeking revenge for a loss of a loved one, and whenever vengeance is concerned, Gotham City enters the dark, dingy alleys of storytelling. The episode opens with a ballerina effigy dancing in a glass dome. An armored man looks at it and he promises to get his cold revenge against the so-called monster who took the love of his life away from him. Gotham City news reporter Summer Gleason brings a series of heists, pulled off by a man with a freeze gun under the spotlight. With this gun, the man could allegedly create thick sheets of snow and ice. Batman hears the news and checks the missing inventory from the Goth Corp, only to realize that these products can be combined to form a large freezing cannon that can pose a threat to the entirety of Gotham. But since the machine still missed one of its parts, Batman knew exactly where he should go to find the mysterious perpetrator. That night, Batman runs into Mr. Freeze, the man behind the icy madness. Batman sustains Freeze's attacks and heads to 
Gothcorp to investigate the matter. After a conversation with Boyle, it is revealed that the one person who could be responsible for this was supposed to be dead as the result of a laboratory accident. Batman later gets his hands on old security footage where he learns the truth behind Mr. Freeze. Originally known as Victor Fries, he had a, a wife named Nora who was terminally ill. To save his love, he put her into a cryogenic status so that he could spend enough time researching to find a cure for her, all while keeping her alive in suspended animation. However, his plans went south when his research funding was cut off for using Gothcorp's equipment without authorization. The security guards of the company then ordered for the plug on Nora's chamber to be pulled. This prompted a horrified Victor to use a gun to threaten them. However, one of the people present, Boyle, kicked Victor into chemicals, filling the room with vapor. Eventually, the guards escaped the situation while Victor found himself being cryogenically frozen alongside his wife, who he reached out to. Even though Batman is moved by the story, he soon finds himself at odds with a newly emerged Mr. Freeze, who reveals that he is incapable of living outside a sub-zero environment after the accident, which explains his suit. Batman tries to reason with Freeze, but the latter is adamant about getting his revenge. He later tries to crash Boyle's humanitarian award ceremony, but is stopped and eventually sent to Arkham Asylum, where he pleads Nora to forgive him for not being able to avenge her. Number 3. Baby Doll This is a disturbing one, and the perfect overview for this would be the fact that a particular plot point from the horror movie known as Orphan is similar to the one of the plot points on this episode. Taking the name of the episode into consideration, it's not hard to guess exactly what is that we're going to talk about. Let's just clarify your suspicion. The episode opens with an actor exiting the theatre after performing in the play Death of a Salesman. He stumbles across a little blonde girl who is crying whilst using her hands to cover her face. After the actor Brian Daly gives her his handcuffs, he gets to see her face. Not only is she utterly shocked, but he also gets knocked out by someone from behind. Soon, the little girl apologizes to Daly for playing rough, giving off the impression that she is repeating a dialogue. It is revealed that several actors from the cast of Love That Baby, which is a 20-year-old sitcom, have recently gone missing. Batman and Robin soon reveal the blonde girl from the first scene of the episode to be the titular character Baby Doll from the sitcom. Turns out Doll has hypoplasia, a rare condition that prevents the human body from physically aging, just like the little girl from Orphan. So Doll, who should be 30 years old, still looks like she's only five. Batman and Robin later run into her when they try to prevent the kidnapping of another cast member known as Tammy Vance. As they chase the kidnapper in the Batmobile, they are cut off by Baby Doll, who throws herself in front of the car. However, they remain oblivious to everything about Baby Doll's condition as such and try to help out the little girl, who seems to be looking for her mummy. Soon enough, another woman takes the girl with her and scolds her, to which Baby Doll replies by using a trademark line from the show, I didn't mean to. Batman and Robin hear the phrase and immediately realize that it is her, but before she can be caught, the other woman uses a smoke bomb to disappear. Batman and Robin continue with their investigation and find out that the cast apparently hated her since she had got them laid off from their job. She left the job out of the blue, bringing the show to an end and subsequently leaving the rest of the acting crew out of their jobs. Cut to Baby Doll's hideout, she is seen preparing her birthday cake with the kidnapped cast, who roar at her in disgust for being as self-absorbed and selfish as usual. Even though they are not related by blood, Baby Doll still behaves that they are all family, just like the characters in the show, much to the displeasure of the others. Ultimately, Baby Doll plays a victim by claiming that she found life to be hard outside the show and wished to bring it back. At the Batcave, Robin points out how the show's ratings had gone down, which prompted the producers to get a new member to the crew. The catch is that the new actor known as Cousin Spunky had taken away Baby Doll's shine and outdone her at her own game. With the center of the popularity being shifted away from her, Baby Doll left the show, bringing the program to an abrupt end. She then tried to pursue a serious acting career but failed miserably. Baby Doll eventually went off the grid until recently, unable to deal with her utter failure as an actor, she wanted her old life back. Batman and Robin track down the actor who played Cousin Spunky and decide to use his upcoming kidnapping to catch Baby Doll. He is soon captured by Baby Doll and her henchman, Mariam, and taken to the hideout, which is a mock set of the original show. With Spunky by Baby Doll's side, the latter decides to take the opportunity to reenact an old birthday scene. However, her cake is quite unusual since she seemed to be using dynamite instead of a candle. The thing is, she plans to die with the rest of the cast in the blast. However, Spunky is revealed to be Robin in disguise, who averts the crisis by getting rid of the dynamite. Batman barges in and disarms everyone, only to engage with Mariam in a 
fight. She buys Baby Doll time, who uses the opportunity to run off to the Funland amusement park. Over there, she comes across the trick mirrors, where one of them shows her how she would have looked had she grown in age. But she also realizes that it is all a delusion and that none of this is real. This causes her to break down and she begins to shoot at mirrors, pulling the trigger constantly even after emptying the barrels. Finally, she clutches Batman's leg and cries uncontrollably. Number 4. Deep Freeze Getting to Mr. Freeze again, Victor Fries finds himself being freed from Arkham Asylum by a powerful robot. Freeze shouts for guard but is taken away soon enough. Meanwhile, Batman analyzes the footage and realizes that Freeze's fear of the situation was not fabricated, which means that he was not the mastermind behind the escape. With Robin, Batman consults robotics expert Carl Rosum, who pinpoints the robot designed to Grant Walker, a theme park mogul. Walker's theme park, Oceana, was on an artificial island located in the sea that was close to Gotham City. Freeze finds himself in that very island and is handed a new suit and Freeze gun. Walker reveals that he wants Freeze to recreate his accident since he had realized that Freeze had become immortal, and just like him, Walker wanted a piece of the cake so that he could continue with his research forever. Freeze refuses to help until he learns that Nora Fries is still alive and is in Walker's cryo tube. As an investor of Gothcorp, Walker was apparently successful at salvaging Nora's tube. Naturally, Freeze decided to help Walker out to get Nora back. Meanwhile, Walker has a built a cannon sized version of the Freeze cold gun to freeze Gotham and eventually the entire world, since he considers the world too cruel to continue. Soon, his robots find Batman and Robin and they capture the duo. At the same time, Mr. Freeze successfully recreates the accident and freezes Walker, who enjoys finding himself in this inconvenient state of being. He heads to his wife but finds Batman, who tells him how Nora would detest him for aiding the death of billions. As such, Freeze helps the duo out. Walker is subsequently attacked and captured in an ice wall. His device is made to over load which compromises Oceana as it soon gets covered in ice because of a chain reaction. In the end, Freeze decides to stay back to be with Nora while Walker begins to sink to the bottom of the sea in a block of ice. Since he is also immortal, Walker finds himself in a position where he is trapped forever while Oceana explodes. A horrible situation for Walker, really. Number 5. Feet of Clay Part 1 and 2 Feet of Clay Part 1 and 2 introduces us to the villain known as Clayface with his disturbing backstory. Matt Hagen used to work as an actor for Imperial Pictures. His skill set had acquired him to the title of the Man of a Million Faces. However, the title unfortunately manifested itself into reality, that too in the worst way possible. Hagen met with an accident that disfigured his face, which is another inconvenient situation for an actor, with plastic surgery being a complicated solution, Hagen soon found that a better way out was when he met Ronald Daggett, a corrupt industrialist. He offered Hagen to be the test subject for his product known as Renew You, which could allegedly restore his face back to what it was. In exchange for this favor, Daggett expected Hagen to impersonate others to carry out the man's dirty work. Unfortunately for Hagen, Renew You turned out to be a super addictive chemical. Hagen went on to impersonate Bruce Wayne with his new shape-shifting abilities since Daggett wanted him to get some fire from Lucius Fox. This got the original Bruce Wayne arrested following an altercation with Fox while Hagen tried to steal a huge amount of Renew You from the factory. He was then caught by Daggett's men who poured a vat of chemicals on his face. He should have died but instead ended up overdosing on the chemicals. Mixed with the Renew You, Hagen soon turned into a mishappen of glob of clay, which is Clayface's signature form. He could morph into other people but only for brief periods of time. With this, his is life destroyed beyond repair by Haggard's product and activities, Hagen now wants revenge, while Daggett appears in a show to promote Renew You. Hagen disguises himself as a woman in the audience and shows off his true form in front of everyone. He then tries to kill Daggett, but a now free Bruce Wayne turns up to the site as Batman and stops Clayface. Meanwhile, Batman uses Clayface's images from his acting days to subdue him, which causes the glob to imitate his old face while losing control. Hagen eventually fakes his death and continues continues with being the villain that is Clayface. Number 6. Two-Face Part 1 and 2 Harvey Dent or Two-Face is one of Batman's most popular antagonists, and just like many of the other characters in Batman's Gallery of Rogues, 
Den also happens to have a disturbing origin story that is technically too dark for a cartoon that targets kids. From the get-go, we are given glimpses of the duality that plagues Harvey Dent. In a nightmare, his doppelganger makes him flip a coin over and over, but when he wakes up, he gives himself a small pep talk and heads out for an auspicious day as a district attorney, seeking to get re-election. During a press release, one of the goons from a previous crime targets Dent and destroys his suit by splattering it with mud. A switch goes off and Dent goes berserk with rage in public. He attacks a man and has to be forced away from him, all while everyone around him is shocked at Dent's behavior. The thing about Dent is that he has a squeaky clean image with a very scandal-free background. To debunk that and destroy Dent's election campaign, mob boss Rupert Thorne tries to get some dirty details on him via a woman named Candice. She is able to track him down to his private therapy session, where Dent opens up about his miserable childhood. It turns out that he has an alter ego called Big Bad Harve. Harve is furious and always seething with rage. Normally, Dent is able to suppress him, but it has been getting increasingly hard. His psychiatrist advises him to check into a facility, which Dent is reluctant to do for his re-election campaign. However, Candice learns of this and passes the information to her boss. During the re-election, Dent is almost about to receive a landslide victory. He wants to add the cherry on the top by proposing to his lover, Grace. However, his parade is rained on soon after by Thorne and his goons, who call for a private audience with Dent. Bruce Wayne, who was present at the scene, finds the situation suspicious and follows Dent as Batman. It is revealed that during Dent's childhood, fighting back against a bully caused the boy to get hospitalized. Ever since that, Dent has always suppressed his anger, which has manifested in the form of Big Bad Harve. Dent soon turns into the alter ego and fights everyone in his space. During a chase, a live cable falls into a vat of chemicals, which blows up a catwalk where Dent had fallen into. The accident catches Dent straight in the face and disfigures it severely. Dent's alter ego is exposed to the public while he is hospitalized. The doctors had imagined a certain amount of permanent scarring, but it is soon revealed that half of his face has turned monstrous. Dent himself is horrified to see himself that way, which is only aggravated by Grace losing consciousness after taking a look. He eventually went on to become the criminal known as Two-Face, who would always flip a coin to make any decision. Number 7. Nothing to Fear After Two-Face, we have the Scarecrow, who happens to be another super disturbing villain in this show. He is notorious for his fear of toxic gas, which makes the victims experience their worst fears. In the case of Bruce Wayne, it is his father considering him to be a failure. With a quest for vengeance against Gotham University, Scarecrow begins to rob the place. Meanwhile, during a charity book signing, Professor Long asks Bruce Wayne about how his father would feel about Bruce's activities as the man who runs Wayne enterprises. Bruce seems to be quite confident in himself, but Dr. Long destroys his mind by glossing over Bruce's ruining Thomas legacy by playing the role of a rich playboy. Soon after, some goons attack the place and Scarecrow happens to be in the party as well. He sprays a gas at everyone, including Bruce Wayne, causing everyone to experience their worst fears during the robbery. Batman, who is weakened, begins to experience his father, considering him to be a failure. It is soon revealed that Scarecrow was a psychology professor at Gotham University, who specialized in fear. He had developed the fear gas to help people conquer their fears, but the nature of the experiment caused the board to expel him for being a so-called lunatic. As such, he was hell-bent on revenge. Meanwhile, Batman begins to have hallucinations of his parents and the media labeling him a failure. Scarecrow strikes once again during the Gotham University Museum benefit, where he floods the room with gas. He gets his hands on the donation money, but also takes Dr. Long as his prisoner after striking him with with his fear toxin. With the crowds dazed in their hallucinations, Batman's arrival makes matters worse for the Dark Knight, who people now perceive to be a giant, dangerous bat who is trying to attack the masses. This causes widespread hysteria amongst the people and stuns Batman. So by the time he can escape from the crowd, Scarecrow is gone. But Batman continues to follow in hot pursuit, using his investigatory skills. As he catches up to the Scarecrow and his henchmen, Batman becomes a victim of his fears once again. Hallucinations of him being a disgrace plague him, but this time, Batman fights back and finally, the vision disappears. In the end, Batman saves Dr. Long, but Scarecrow gets away once again. Batman had used a part of Scarecrow's mask to analyze him. He narrows the origin of the mask down to Crane Chemicals, a place that was owned by a man named Jonathan Crane. His deductions are proven right when Batman visits the chemical plant and find Scarecrow. However, Scarecrow becomes a subject to his own fear toxin and begins to see Batman as a giant bat-like demon. Ultimately, 
he is apprehended. Number 8. The Worry Men This is another episode that shows us just how powerful and dangerous mind control can be. It opens with Veronica Vreeland's fundraiser event where Bruce Wayne is in attendance. The hot topic of conversation happens to be miniature dolls known as Worry Men, which, when placed under the pillow at night, can elevate one's stress. The level of stress Bruce often finds himself in happens to be insurmountable, so he ends up getting his hands on the dolls as well. When Batman goes to sleep at night, Alfred slips in some Worry Men under Bruce his pillow. Things take a turn for the worst when Bruce Wayne withdraws several millions of dollars from his company account the next day, only to throw the money away. However, Bruce seems to have no recollection of this event. Meanwhile, several attendees from Veronica's party get arrested and as such, Bruce follows her trail. But she seems to be in a strange situation as well, when he spots her trying to throw a valise from a ship. When she checks the valise, she is shocked to see that it is full of her jewellery. Batman asks Veronica about the place that she got her worry dolls from. She tells him about a souvenir shop in South America, prompting Batman to check the dolls. He finds a microchip embedded inside each one of them and deduces who the culprit might be. Batman reveals to Alfred that the Mad Hatter is behind the whole fiasco. He has been playing with the subconscious mind with his microchips. Soon Batman tracks him down to a costume supply factory where the Hatter is throwing a fit over the failed robbery, attempting concerning Veronica's expensive jewellery. Batman crashes the party and engages the Mad Hatter and his henchmen, while the Hatter claims that he will give up his his life as a criminal after acquiring enough money from his retirement. In the end, the Mad Hatter tries to use a real guillotine to get rid of Batman. However, right before the blade drops, Batman sends off a sonic pulse that disables Hatter's mind control devices, allowing Batman to escape the sticky situation. Number 9. Perchance to Dream Batman finds himself in a twisted dreamlike situation, which is almost like a dream come true for him. But as things go, Bruce Wayne suddenly finding himself living a good life is recipe for major disaster in the outside world. The episode kicks off with Batman fighting goons in a warehouse. He walks into a trap and is soon knocked out by a mysterious source. Fortunately for him, it turns out to be a dream and he wakes up with Alfred greeting him. Trouble comes knocking when Alfred seems to be oblivious to Bruce being Batman to the point that he considers Robin to be a girlfriend of his and not a crime-fighting partner. A flabbergasted Bruce tries to get to the Batcave but does not find the secret entrance. Things get aggravated when he realizes that his parents are still alive. He seeks out Alfred who explains that Bruce heads Wayne Enterprises as its face while the company is run by Lucius Fox. He is also supposed to marry Selina Kyle soon. When Bruce meets Selina that day, he spots Batman who is trying to stop a jewel heist. Selina claims that the crime fighter showed up in Gotham City out of nowhere. Bruce asks her about the Catwoman, but she is clueless. Stuck in this mess, Bruce seeks out Dr. Leslie Tompkins and tells her about his memories of being Batman. However, Tompkins mentions how these memories are Bruce's manifested fantasy, as he never really achieved anything in life since he was handed everything on a silver platter. As such, Bruce coped with his lack of accomplishments by creating the false persona of a greatly accomplished character. Bruce manages to let go of Batman and becomes happier than he ever has been. He then picks up a newspaper, but he is unable to read. The words are all jumbled up and indecipherable, making Bruce understand that this world has been fabricated. Realizing that this is just a dream, Bruce finds himself coming face to face with Batman, blaming him for putting Bruce in the situation. Bruce pulls Batman's mask away and reveals the Mad Hatter, who was the main culprit of the situation. He had invented the simulation to give Bruce everything that he could ever ask for, while leaving no escape routes. However, Bruce overlooks the side of a tower and decides to commit suicide in the false world. Back in reality, Bruce Wayne returns to his state of consciousness, where he finds himself being subjected to the Mad Hatter's device for mind control. It is soon revealed that the Hatter wanted to get rid of Batman desperately, prompting him to create a simulation that will give Batman his ideal life. However, the Hatter is apprehended and Bruce is forced to return to his rather dark and unhappy reality. Maybe it's time for Batman to return to the night that spawned him, before anyone else gets hurt. Number 10. I Am The Knight Batman finds himself in a state of despair after Jimmy the Jazzman Peak almost manages to end Commissioner Gordon's life. Bruce deals with feelings of incompetence from the get-go as he wonders if his crime fighting was doing any good at all, considering the influx of criminals. He also learns of a boy who scoffs at the idea of Batman, which leaves another dent on his sense of self. But Batman gets entangled in the boy's fight with some thugs, which makes him late for an important police raid. With Batman 
that man's absence, Commissioner Gordon gets fatally wounded thanks to mob boss Jimmy the Jazzman. Even though the criminal is apprehended, Bruce is unable to deal with the damage caused to Gordon. While Gordon is hospitalized, Bruce falls into a pit of terrible guilt, which is only aggravated by Harvey Bullock blaming Batman for being late. As he goes back to the Batcave, he destroys his mask and his forensic equipment, deciding to give up on his life as a crime fighter, screaming in despair. While Batman becomes a victim of self-pity, Jazzman gets sent to Stonegate Penitentiary. He intends to escape and kill Commissioner Gordon once and for all to exact his revenge on Gordon, as the latter had previously caught him. Dick Grayson finds a moping Bruce Wayne who cannot bear to be the man behind his father figure's compromised situation. He thinks everyone close to him will eventually become a victim of his incompetence, while the Jazzman escapes Stonegate and heads to the hospital to kill Gordon. When they learn that Jazzman is free, Dick asks Bruce to take care of the situation and protect Gordon, but Bruce does not respond. Stuck in a desperate state, Dick suits up and heads out to catch Jazzman. However, Batman soon comes out of his state of misery and dons the Batman costume once again as he sets off to save Gordon. At the hospital, Barbara Gordon finds Jazzman in her father's room and shields his body with her own. Following a violent fight between Jazzman and Batman, as Jazzman tries to fire, Batman uses his batarang to make the bullet backfire, which ends up injuring Jazzman himself. The guards recapture the criminal while Gordon wakes up soon after. Turns out, he had tried to be a hero like Batman and gotten himself severely injured in the process. In the end, Gordon tells Batman that he is a hero, which renews the latter's spirit. Good evening, folks. I'm the Joker. Living proof that you don't have to be crazy to host this show, but it helps. Number 11. Almost got him. In this episode, Batman carries out a sting operation, disguised as Killer Croc in a bar. He sits with several of the villains from his gallery of rogues, and they all discuss how they almost managed to kill the Cape Crusader. Poison Ivy talks about attacking Batman with her gas and almost unmasking him due to his weakened state. Two-Face talks about restraining Batman and deciding between getting Batman squashed or his bones shattered, only for Batman to escape soon after. Killer Croc's story does not amuse anyone, as he claims to have thrown a big rock at the masked vigilante. The Penguin talks about spraying Batman Batman with a nectar that poison beaked hummingbirds feasted on. He subsequently threw Batman into an aviary full of those birds, but Batman managed to evade that situation as well, despite getting pecked several times. When it's time for the Joker, he talks about an event where he blocked Gotham City for his talk show. He had gotten an audience who were held hostage while Batman was strapped to an electric chair. Anytime the audience laughed, Batman would be subject to electric shocks, which would only increase with intensity of the laughter. To ensure that the audience keeps laughing, they were also subject to a strong dose of laughing gas, to the point that they would laugh at a phone book. Soon Catwoman broke in to save Batman and succeeded at doing so, but she herself fell victim to Harley Quinn, who knocked her out. The Joker then came up with a horrifying and disturbing plan to get to Batman. He would take Catwoman to the cat food factory, turn her into cat food, and deliver it to Batman. Disguised as Killer Croc, Batman's sting operation turns out to be successful, as he finds out the Joker's main motive. He reveals his identity to the villains, while Gordon, Bullock, and their forces surround the place. The villains are subsequently arrested and Batman finds a restrained Catwoman in the cat food factory and manages to save her. It's over, Bolton. And finally, number 12, Lock Up. The cops turn into the criminal in this episode as Arkham Asylum's notorious chief of security, Lyle Bolton, becomes a man of the inmates' nightmares. As Batman and Robin return Scarecrow to the asylum, the man who made a career out of scaring people cowers in fear. Turns out he had left Arkham to escape from Lyle Bolton, who promises the heroes that he will keep a stern watch on Scarecrow. While Robin finds his dedication impressive, Batman realizes that something is not right. A review hearing is convened following inquiries made by Bruce about Bolton. Commissioner Gordon and Mayor Hill attend the event alongside Dr. Bartholomew. However, Bolton had previously been labelled as the perfect man for his job profile at Arkham. Bolton sails through the hearing with his earnestness, but Bruce does not fail to notice the fear and intimidation within the inmates, including the likes of Harley Quinn. He quickly announces that Bolton's contract will be extended for 18 months to test the situation. The asylum inmates begin to panic 
because they confessed that Bolton had been physically and verbally abusive towards them. Bolton cries out, calling the criminal scum, who should be killed. He is soon restrained and fired, prompting him to blame the so-called gutless police and bureaucrats instead of the criminals for the crime in Gotham City. He returns six months later for his revenge and abducts Summer Gleason for presenting him negatively in the media. This time, he dons his new identity and goes by the name Lockup. Bruce gets to the man who claims that he wants to work alongside the Dark Knight. While Batman would be tasked with apprehending the criminals, Lockup would lead those criminals to their death to create a just society. Naturally, Batman disagrees with his idea of justice, but Lockup gets away. Soon, Dr. Bartholomew and Gordon go missing. Batman anticipates that the Mayor Hill will be Lockup's next target and uses him as bait to get to the criminal. Batman tracks down Lockup and finds his allies who have been imprisoned. Ultimately, Robin frees everyone while Batman subdues Lockup in a fight. In the end, Lyle Bolton returns to Arkham, but this time as an inmate. He is not miserable, however, as he considers this to be the perfect opportunity that will allow him to keep an eye on the others, especially because the criminals cause him to lose his job. He wants his revenge. And if you liked our content, well, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone. Bang. You know he's the Dark Knight, but we prefer to think of him as history.